I've done a video on this before, but I can't remember what it was called, and I do too many videos, so I can't find it, and somebody was asking me about Laodicea again. Um, are they believers? Who are they? What does it mean? So I'll try to cover this quickly. Um, my view of the letter to the seven churches is that those are seven assemblies that existed at the time John wrote the letter and then also in the way they're arranged and the errors they sub they describe the things that Christ admonishes them about in the sequence they're arranged it spells out church history in advance prophetically so on the one hand they are literal churches on the other hand they are references to ages or periods in church history that are clearly you can clearly find them uh find those ages in church history now three of the letters um refer to the time from the first to the third or fourth century fifth century and then four of the letters basically describe characteristics of the church age that persist from about that time until now. So Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea all describe characteristics of the visible church that persist today. And all four of those have references to the Lord's coming. So they persist until he comes. Um, Philadelphia, in that batch, Philadelphia is the only one that he has nothing good to, or nothing bad to say. And he tells them he will keep them from the hour of trial that will come upon the whole earth. Sardis, he tells them that they won't watch and he's going to come upon them as a thief. Thyatira, he says he's going to throw Jezebel and her children into the tribulation. And then Laodicea, he says he's going to spew them out of his mouth. Um, now, the question is, are the first question is, are these believers or non-believers? Well, it's a mix. Uh, the churches are lampstands. And they are lampstands because they are the assembly of the Lord's people that have the testimony of Christ. So they do shine with that testimony. They're legitimate churches. But in their midst, there is a mix of believers and unbelievers. So this can clearly be seen in Thyatira because Jezebel and her children are there and they know the depths of Satan and are attempting to seduce God's servants to commit spiritual fornication and actually involve themselves in occult mysteries. And, you know, historically that was the Catholic Church, but that today we see that in the Emergent and the NAR, um, and I won't go too far into that, but you're talking about basically warlocks masquerading as believers and, and having teaching positions and dressing occult satanic mysteries in biblical terminology to attempt to deceive God's people and involve them with satanic spirituality. Um, well, those are clearly not believers. <laughs> and yet they're there in the church at Thyatira. Uh, so the when you realize that, that it is... The church in the sense of the assembly. Not the church is the body of Christ. In the body of Christ, there are only believers who have been regenerated. But in the assemblies, there's a mix. There's false believers. There's uh, false converts. There's wheat. There's tares. There's a mix, right? But they're still lampstands because that's where the testimony of Christ is going forth. The word. Um, so there are some regenerated people there. So then there becomes a distinction between those who have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, who are also the overcomers, who are also the believers, and those who are not. And 
we know that the overcomers are believers because John defines overcomer for us in 1 John where he says, Who is he that overcomes the world but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So John had already written Revelation when he wrote that. He wrote his. He came back from Patmos and moved to uh, Ephesus after his exile and wrote the Gospel of John and his epistles. And he has the last word on the subject of what an overcomer is. And so we need to let him define that term. And that's pretty strong because... I was with a group of people that made a big deal about the overcomers, and they said that they weren't just normal believers, they were like super believers. <laughs> and only the overcomers would uh, not be in the tribulation, and only the overcomers would uh, end up uh, inheriting the kingdom and all kinds of stuff. No, the overcomers are believers. They have a spirit. And because they have the spirit, they know the voice of their shepherd, and they will hear what the spirit is saying to the churches, or they should. Um, okay, so then in Laodicea, that is characteristic of the last age. It was a real church, but it was also a, one of the characteristics of the last age of the church, the last period of church history. And what you have is, as I mentioned, in Laodicea, there were two aqueducts. One was warm and one was cold, and they produced a, they came together and produced a lukewarm mixture, and they were known, apparently, for this water that tasted terrible and so the Lord apparently is using that as a spiritual a metaphor for spiritual things and that mixture, see Laodicea means the letter, the name of the letter in each of these uh, letters interestingly summarizes the meaning of the letter and that is amazing because the Gentiles named those cities hundreds of years before, and yet the Lord arranged the events so that they would name it so that when he wrote to his church in that city, he anticipated their needs, and the city name describes the situation at the church. It's amazing uh, if you just think about that, but it shows the sovereignty of God in human history. Um... But uh, in Laodicea, Laodicea means opinions of the people, a rule of the laity, okay? So this lukewarm mixture comes from the overthrow of almost every authority. Uh, it's postmodernism, I think. It's like your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. And you can't be dogmatic about it and we need to be broad. And in Laodicea, uh, the Bible is not the authority. Opinion is the authority. Um, so that's one thing. And that really describes the age we live in today. You go to a, I, It's almost impossible to find a Bible study. What you do is you go to these facilitated group meetings where somebody brings out a book and uses that as a discussion platform for everybody to share their opinion. And then the facilitator's job is to keep everybody in the so-called unity by admonishing every single one of them to accept everybody else's opinion. You know, and if anybody gets dogmatic or doctrinal and says, no, that's not the way it is, this is the truth, they say, no, you need to be broader than that, and they stigmatize them. So eventually the uh, believer that loves the word isn't going to be able to survive in an environment like that. You can either, I always say, you can either nod and smile and pretend to agree with what you don't agree with, or you can open your mouth, be rebuked, be stigmatized, and then eventually leave because you're going to be branded as negative and divisive. Well, that's Christianity today. That's Laodicea. It's the, what, what matters is everybody's opinion, brother. But everybody's opinion, the thing about that is it can be manipulated. So er, they use this Hegelian dialectic to synthesize the opinions by presenting thesis and antithesis. So there's two sides of every argument, and they will naturally come up in these discussions, and then the facilitator bridges them to kind of come up with a compromise that's a synthesis of the two. But the compromise is really 
directed either by the agenda of the church or by the spirit of the age, it always leads to conclusions that take people further and further away from the world, a word and further and further into the world. And they're being manipulated into thinking that they decided to go there. So, and, I, and I've done a video videos on that. If you want to look at my trends in the apostatizing church, I think I have a, a message called, it's a playlist on my thing. It, there's a message called uh, the secret weapon of small groups or something like that. So I don't want to get too far into that, but this is how Satan is infiltrating the church is through this consensus forming lukewarm mixture. Okay. Now, if you're part of that mixture and you don't sense that something's awry, it's because you aren't bothered by the fact that they've so far deviated from the word that the word has no authority there anymore. And if you're not bothered by that, there's probably a problem. Okay, so this is lukewarm. It's a tepid, nobody's going to be strong for any opinion. It's just a blend, you know, it's just a blend. And and the Lord hates it. He says he's going to spew that out of his mouth. Because he said, I wish you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Now, what he promises, what he admonishes them to do is to buy from him gold that's been tried in the fire, I sell so that they can see, and white raiment so that the shame of their nakedness would be, uh, not be uncovered. Now, those three things are the basics of salvation. Um, gold tried in the fire is the precious faith. Peter tells us that, that our faith, which is more precious than gold than per that perishes, uh, though it be tried by fire, will be found to praise and honor and glory at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's our faith. But gold in the Bible is also a picture of the divine nature. The inside of the tabernacle, uh, the it, the Ark of the Covenant, the inside and the outside was covered with gold. Um, this talks about the holy life of God himself, really. Anything gold is speaking of God himself and his nature. And Christ is the vessel, and he, dis he dispenses the divine life and makes it available. So... It's really to have the faith and have his life. That's the gold tried by fire. And his life has been tried and tested in every way. He was tempted at every point without sin. And then he he conquered death. Death could not hold him. So he's even been tested by death. And it just is completely imperishable. That's the imperishable life. Gold that's been tried by fire. And then the eye salve so that you can see is the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So that you can understand spiritual things. Uh, the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are spiritually discerned. But we have the mind of Christ. We've received the Spirit who searches out the depths of God and reveals to us the things that, uh, the mysteries of God, even the things that were predestined to our glory from the foundation of the world, which eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, what God has in store for those who love him. So this is the related to the mysteries of God and the Christ and the church and what spiritual truth. Your eyes have to be open to be able to see this sort of thing. And that is by the Spirit. And we re we're sealed with the Spirit when we believe. And then there's the white garment. Well, that's clearly Christ's righteousness. And we are either naked, meaning we're in our filthy rags and our own righteousness, and there's no covering for us at the judgment seat. Or we have Christ's righteousness. And, you know, Galatians 3 says as many as were baptized into Christ were clothed with Christ. And that's why we're blessed with faithful Abraham. That's why we're not judged. Because God sees us in Christ. That is the mystery of our position. That we are in Christ and we come to God in Christ. And when we come to him, he sees Christ coming to him. And so he's satisfied with us and even likes us and enjoys us and loves us because we are accepted in the beloved. So that is the three things that he tells them to buy. Now the word buy is interesting because all these things are free gift, right? Why does he tell them to buy it? 
Well, he just finished rebuking him because he said, you say I'm rich and increased with goods, but have need of nothing. So this is a very wealthy group of people that boast in their riches. And I think he uses that to say, look, your riches are worthless. They purchase nothing. You're out investing and tracking your money and buying and selling and doing things, but you're buying nothing of value. Why don't you buy what I have for you, right? Now he says, you are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, but you do not know that you are miserable, poor, wretched, blind, and naked. And it's interesting because that's five items, which is the number of grace. But they're naked, so they need his white garment. And they're miserable and poor and wretched. They have nothing of real value. They're poor. They have money. They say they're rich, but they're poor. But he says you're blind. So not only are they naked and poor, but they're blind. They don't see their need. They don't, they are not aware that they need anything. This is lukewarm. This is what lukewarm does. It lulls you into sleep where you think everything's fine. I'm going to the mall, you know, and uh, that is America today. That is the West today, you know. So that's why we know that this is really typical of this age. In the churches, and I'm talking about the mainstream denominational churches, they're, they're a lukewarm mixture where no one feels anything and anyone who is passionate is stigmatized and an oddball and does not fit in. It's for people who really just want to have a nice time. And they're rich, and they think they have need of nothing. So they're blind, and they don't see their spiritual poverty. So the, they really need the eye salve so that they can see that they are deeply sinful. And they need to come to a crisis where they realize their need for the blood to cover them, and their need for regeneration and their need to be covered with Christ's garment, the white garment, and their need for the real riches, which is the faith and his life. And unless they have ears to hear, they're not going to hear this message. And therefore he says, I am, behold, I'm outside. I'm, I'm knocking at the door. He's pictured as standing on the outside of this church, knocking and if anyone opens up to him, he'll come in and fellowship with them or sup with them. And this really refers to the fellowship we have in as believers. So all of the things he offers are really the things that get you saved, that are the inheritance of a believer. So they're not special rewards to the overcomer. They are things that these people are admonished to have instead of the riches they're boasting in. So, if you want to know who the lukewarm people are, they're people who affiliate themselves with Jesus culturally at any level, but have never been to a crisis where they realize they actually need what he has. They, th they may think they're going to heaven, or they may not. I mean, I know Christ Christians in name who would even debate that. I mean, they're just basically atheists who, like Christianity for some reason, won't stop going to church. But then there's all kinds of degrees. There's there's people who think they're genuinely, you know, serving God and serving the Lord by getting the church ready for the next apple pie picnic or whatever. But there's no conviction. No conviction. Now, the false legalists tell us that we're lukewarm because we have a different view of repentance than they do. And here's where I would like to say that repentance is a essential ingredient that there has to come a place of crisis in your life where you realize that you personally need salvation. But repentance is not a commitment to God that you're going to turn and change your life. It is 
the realization that you can't make such a claim because you're ruined and therefore you must lay hold of Christ so that he can become your righteousness and once he is your righteousness you're not called to repent 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 you're called to learn and grow in him and we make a big stick about the word repentance because it's misused to say that you have to basically live sinless perfection. And if you've sinned today and haven't repented of it, whatever that means, turn from it and never done it again and forsaken it, then you are in danger and you're not maybe not saved or you're going to lose your salvation. You can't repent of your sin that way. You can't cast your sin away like that you can hope you can beg the lord for mercy so that you wouldn't do that thing but until he has until you enjoy his grace in that area you won't have victory over it and so we just have a different view of repentance that it's a turn away from self-effort and a turn towards god and that sounds semantic <clears throat> now when it comes it's but it, it's essential if people are making the word repentance a requirement for salvation apart from faith um, or in addition to faith. Now, the reason I say all that is because the ones at Laodicea truly need to repent. <laughs> they have not been brought into conviction about their state at all. And I, you will meet believers and you'll wonder if they're lukewarm because they go to church and they say they believe that they believe all that, but you never, ever see them crack open a Bible. They don't seem to care that there's anything false going on or true or whatever. And they don't care that the Lord is coming. And they don't care about justification by faith. By faith. They don't care about any of these battles. They are just living their life and they think they're saved. And you go, I don't know if they are. Now, really, only the Lord knows. Only the Lord knows who really believes in Christ and cannot deny and must confess that he is the Son of God and his blood was shed for them. But that Laodicean situation, even though it's really describing unbelievers, uh, can impact. Because if you get raised in an environment like that, let's say you get saved when you're five or six, but then you go to a church like that all your life, there's little hope unless God really does a move on you that you're going to stand for him and he needs to get you out of that situation so you need to have ears to hear so eventually the saved ones should get out of these situations but I can't speak for all of them I, I know people that I think I, that person is lukewarm is he saved I can't tell he's but I have to go to, well, what does he confess? Does he confess that Jesus is the Son of God? Does he confess that Jesus died for his sins? And you go, if he did, then you have to say, well, that's a brother. That can't be someone who's going to be spewed out of the mouth of Jesus, although they certainly seem to be living in that kind of numbness. They definitely have the characteristic. So you can be a believer and have all the characteristics of an unbeliever if you're not walking according to the Spirit. And God will deal with you you may be raptured and have absolutely zero reward, caught off guard, he came upon you like a thief, and you're suddenly standing before the judgment seat, saved as yet through fire, suffering loss of all your rewards, all your works being consumed, and with no abiding fruit, and no crown, and no reward. But hey, at least you're saved. So that's what Paul talks about, is at the judgment seat, and that can be a terrifying prospect, to stand before the judgment seat and have zero reward. Um... I guess that that's possible for some of these people or they're just not saved. I, you know, uh, those that he's going to spit out of their mouth are not saved. Those who are saved, but have those characteristics will have no reward if they don't, uh, come back to their first love or see their need for the Lord, uh, and walk in, in, uh, some degree of faith. So, now, I'm not saying works, I'm not saying repentance in the way that the Lord Shippers use it and all that, but there is a crisis that comes, and we are called to, we are accountable for the light we have, and we are right up 
against the Lord's coming. See, this church particularly pisses the Lord off because they're right up against his coming and have the, should have the most spiritual knowledge available to them. The word is speaking most clearly to them and they just don't care. You know, I mean, that's really what it comes down to is they just do not care. They're about their life and that's all they want to talk about. And you can't get them to talk about spiritual things. You can try until you blew the faith and they won't do it. And yet, if you try to say, I, I'm not sure you're saved, they're going to argue and say, yes, I am, you know, and it's just a mystery. How could you be like this? You know, only the Lord knows. So I hope this, this shouldn't, this one, we should not be so clear about the letters of the seven churches that we can ever look at someone and say, oh, you're one of these. The Lord tries the reins of the heart. Only he knows. And he'll judge in that day according to the secrets of the heart by the gospel. It's whether or not you actually believe the gospel. That's what gets you saved and in, no matter what your condition is. But in the churches, there's a mix of people. And we're not here to judge them other than to recognize that these conditions exist and not be stumbled when you come across them. And uh, all right. Well, have a good day. Hopefully this is uh, edifying.